for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak. It's always good to thank you, thank people beforehand, and they don't really know what they're presenting for. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about today is, uh, is not minding the gap, right? There could, there could be a gap, there could not be a gap, that's to be determined. But I want to talk about the hype cycle. Do, do any of you think there's a hype cycle in data science? Is it to our disadvantage? <laughs> At this point, is it to our disadvantage? Is it to our advantage? Yeah. Depends. Right. How many of you are? Uh, I think most of us have a have a mixed relationship with hype cycles, right? I mean, how many of you are from practice? I see some practitioners in the room. How many times have you had um, a boss come in after the weekend and said, "You know, I played around with golf with my friends, and they talked about this big data analytics, and we have to do it in like two weeks. Can you do that? We need to. We need to do it now. Right. It's the thing. You have to do it." Um, I think, so that's, I, I, I've experienced it if you've done The rest is probably then from academia. So how many of you from academia? Yeah. And how many, how many times have you had a, a, a professor or a colleague, normally a senior professor comes back from some world congress and something and says, you know what, I heard this thing. It's called deep learning and we have to do it. Right. This is the thing. Drop everything, we're now writing all our things for that. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. Because that's exactly how I got into the field. 15 years ago, my PhD supervisor had this brilliant idea in the morning, and he tells the story, sitting on the, on the toilet, reading the computer cycle, and, uh, he read about artificial neural networks, and they're going to revolutionize the world. And um, I proposed three PhD topics to him, and he always said, that is a brilliant topic, if you can do that with neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what about customer, customer segmentation? And uh, that's also a great topic, if you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I went away, I said, I found a new network. None of these things have anything to do with new networks. And he said, Yes, so find something that works with new networks. <laughs> <laughs> that took me a few years. And um, why am I hopped up on the hype cycle? Because during the time, over the last 15 years, new networks have gone through the hype cycle so many times. They were in, they were out, they were in, they were out, they got funding, they got no funding. At the moment, under the pretense of being machine learning, which is in the room. Under the pretense of doing machine learning, which has different pots of money and gold stuff to wear and computer science somewhere, again, feed forward neural networks under the topic of deep learning while getting substantial attention. Um, so there is a hype, I think. But the reality that we do in business with business consultancy and uh, in them trying to implement our research into practice, we often are faced with a complete reluctance to, to embrace even much, much simpler things. So that's what this is going to be about. I want to spread that out a little bit. You know, what's the what's the hype cycle like? What do senior management look like? And then what is the reality? So we did a survey, and I'm going to show you some evidence on what people are actually using. And then I'm going to explore that gap a little bit and see whether we can deal with it uh, because there's a lot of that. So um, I've already had a brilliant introduction. Thanks a lot. I'm from Lancaster University. I'm originally from Hamburg, but I've um, uh, been working there for uh, a few years. Um, we do training courses uh, with executive education. Most of the time I teach normal students, bachelor's, master's, PhDs, but we also engage quite heavily with industry because that's a big important part in England as a third mission. So we've had the pleasure of working with a whole range of companies over the last um, 15 years. Um, and that's not all of them actually. And it goes really, uh, there's a strong supply chain focus in, in forecasting. It's normally looking at time series prediction, much less at classification, other things, although the other projects isn't there. So we really have a pretty good view on what industry is using from, from anecdotal evidence to rigor, more rigorous surveys, all the way from retailers, all the way up to manufacturers of, um, of raw materials. And um, so I thought I'd share some of these things. So that's what I want to talk about, the hype. Is it there? Uh, well, you already know it, it's probably there, yeah? So let's see who's driving the hype and, and how they're driving the hype and what is hype at the moment. And then we can look at the gap. Is there a gap? And maybe that we it would be helpful to say it doesn't help them to say there's a gap. How big is it? Right? Are we like six months behind? Twelve months behind? A little bit more? You know, so that depends on how fast we have to run. And then we can see how we close that. Oh, straightforward. Um, I, I presume most of you have heard of the Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies. Yes? That is one of the important uh, sources of, uh, of information for senior management. The idea is that new technologies are introduced all the time. And um, but how do you discern valuable new technologies that you should invest in and other technologies that you want your competitors to invest in? Right? Um, that's a bit of a problem. So um, what is commercially viable? Also, I mean, looking at the startup community, you know, what is the right time to get into this? 
You know, how, how mature does, that, does something have to be in order to make it into a, from an innovative product to a real innovation in the market? Yes. So what um, what Carlos came up with, they, they basically say every, every technology goes through a number of phases, right? With expectations being high and from low to high. And you normally have a technology trigger. Then you go into the peak of inflated expectations. I like the way they phrase this. Then comes the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> The slope of enlightenment, I have no idea. I, I think they were consuming particular products. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the irony in the whole thing in itself. <laughs> and then you have a plateau of productivity. So of course they say all of these technologies, just like a product lifecycle, everything goes through this uh, until it's actually productive and you can implement it. And um, uh, so that is our By the way, do you know in the latest Gartner Hive cycle, what is the newest technology trigger that came in? Smart dust. You all know what smart dust is? <laughs> well, how come you don't know that? Right. It's going to be, okay, you're going to hear a lot more about smart, smart dust. <laughs> and then people are going to be really fed up with smart dust. And then at some point, smart dust is going to work. Or, because they also judge it, how long is maintenance reduction? Two years, two to five years, five to ten years, more than ten years, or actually it's going to become obsolete before it even plateaus. Right? Because something new and cooler comes along and just takes away all the space and the attention span of the CIOs too. Um, so if we look at that, um, that for managerial decision making, it's a, it's a question, should we, should we make an early move, take a moderate approach and so forth? Most people, most funding agencies don't read into this, but it disseminates into their, into their um, share of mind at times, you know? So um, let's start in the, in the old days, right? Before any of us were ever on the hype cycle. Would that be good? That would be 2009. Not too long ago. I, slightly disappointing to me because I've been working on newer networks for a few years at the time, um, and they weren't bad anyway. Uh, but um, so these are the things. There's some some familiar things that you can see today. I'm not sure if you can recognize it in the back, but uh, there's cloud computing. Of course, you've got to get copies of the slides, of course, so you can actually study this and see where your pet peeve died. <laughs> yeah, very important and something died. Um, you have things like tablet PCs or internet TV. Some of the stuff that 2009 was actually a real innovation, but today it's just completely ubiquitous, right? Everywhere, it's everywhere. But there's loads of things that have died since then. Um, I don't know what happened to a green IT. A really good thing. Um, but then there's augmented reality and some of the things, mobile robots, which are just coming into play now. Um, but if you study this carefully, there's nothing there about data mining, analytics, predictive, prescriptive, data science, or any of that. That was before SPSS and SAS started to churn out these kind of terminology and had large, uh, sorry, IBM, uh, had large market expand on it. Um, that's in 2010, right? So you can see something's changed. A new person comes in and he actually adds 20 new items to the list and drops a few other ones that his predecessor didn't have. And in all of that, do you see where, where we are, where we came in? And by the way, I'm not a big fan of saying, no, I'm a data scientist, I'm not a predictive analyst, right? Um, because all in all, it's all some flavor of statistics computing, probably with a business application merged together, right? So, um, anything? You can see anything? Gesture control? Computer brain interface? Anybody working on that? No? Okay. No, pretty good analytics. Look at that. They didn't look at it beforehand, and suddenly it comes on the slope of enlightenment. That's how good we were. We basically went through this in a year. No, they're just not very good. You know, it's not a rigorous study, right? So, let's just take this with a bit of but, so printed analytics, pretty successful already. What is the biggest buzzword that has lagged in the last couple of years? Big data, anybody else for big data? Deep learning. Deep learning? Really? How can that lag? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So big data. Big data is one of the biggest things that has, you know, I mean if you if you are on LinkedIn, that's that's the thing. If you have a filter for big data, you basically don't get any more LinkedIn messages. Um, <laughs> big data was in. Next year, 2011, big data comes in. Big data and extreme information processing. Predictive analytics, still there. <laughs> no, no progress. It did go back. Okay. Um, next year, oh, big data. Big data is really climbing up to the peak of inflated expectations. Still there. A little bit, okay. A little bit moved on, but a little, still basically there. And um, then big data is climbing up. Now suddenly they realize there's more to predictive analytics. They say prescriptive analytics. That could be the next big thing, right? Um, I don't know why they didn't look at descriptive analytics because 
you look at the development of Tableau and others over the time, I mean, that, that's quite a substantial impact they had on business, but it's not bad. But you can see, we're still there, right? We're clinging on. We're not really making a lot of progress. And 2014, we're finally out. We made it. Big data's on the way down into the trough of disillusionment. Uh, and there's a new player that's completely new and never heard of before, which is completely different. It's called data science. Can you explain to me the difference between predictive analytics and data science, please? <laughs> and in particular, because it's, it's a little bit more hyped than prescriptive analytics. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 2015, everything's gone. <laughs> it's all gone. They just dropped everything from the hype cycle. Everything. Machine learning up there. Just, oh, well spotted, yeah. I'll show that to you in a second. Exactly. But the things that they've been tracking, predictive analytics, big data is no longer on the hype cycle. And there is lots of papers on Katie Nuggets, people write about. You know, they drop data, they drop big data, they drop big data. Yeah, they also drop predictive analytics. They also <coughs> dropped data science. They also dropped all the analytical decision making because they made an argument that, you know, it just, it's not the big data that counts, it's actually the, analyst, the decisions that you make afterwards, but they drop those as well. So maybe that is, don't believe the hype, as uh, Chuck T used to say. Um, but there are new things there. They replace that with citizen data science. <laughs> and and uh, neuro business, I to this day, having worked in the field for almost 18 years, I have no idea what neuro business is. <laughs> and nobody else had gotten a new. Um, advanced analytics and machine learning is there. Okay, so there's certainly, whatever happened, um, it's all gone. Do you, how do you feel? Quite sad. <laughs> I was there just a moment ago. I was supposed to get funding. Yeah. Don't worry, because what they did, rather than have just one hype cycle, they created additional ones, and we now have our own. It's a hype cycle of advanced analytics. <laughs> the only problem is, predictive analytics is back there. <laughs> <laughs> and in database analytics and other things are coming up there. So my point is obviously there's a good result. However, whatever you see in this, this is, a, this is an area that's really been hyped. It's continues to be hyped. If you think about it, we were here, and we're now going back. We're behind load forecasting, okay, take that. But, um, but uh, we're behind prescriptive analytics and probably a few other things like deep learning. But um, we're still in the hype cycle, right? Uh, and if you see it that way, they just gave us five more years. Five more years to be in the hype cycle. And, uh, um, but what does that mean? I mean, it doesn't really tell me anything about the algorithms. So I, I looked to okay, Nugget, KDD Nuggets to look at what kind of algorithms they are. These are the really, these are the hype algorithms that the data scientist uses today. And the top elements sorted from top to bottom, the blue bars are the ones, the percentage used in 2016. And you can, of course, you can use more than one algorithm. People tend to use more than one algorithm. <laughs> As a data scientist, just a thought, you know, not just always in your network. 2011, uh, so you can see the most, single most used algorithm in data science is regression. That's been around a while, hasn't it? <laughs> Clustering. Decision trees and visualization. Okay. <laughs> so, there are other things as well. Random forest, of course. There's ensemble methods, boosting, bagging, support vector machines. Deep learning is here. And I think the value of decomposition. So, a number of novel techniques, but I think they're mixing up some tasks with algorithms from, a, from an academic point of view. But it's certainly interesting to see that there's quite a bit of um, development. Most of the um, data scientists are using more than one algorithm, on average eight. Uh, when they did the survey before in 2011, it was an average four. So the, the scope is broad. That's not inter uninteresting, I think. <coughs> and, and what I want to talk about today is time series, right? And time series is, oh, by the way, these are the biggest winners. Right? Visualization, boosting, banking, text mining, and time series. Time series is that. Wow, that's my field. I quite like that. Yeah, so um, um, having a look at that, I thought, you know, it doesn't really tell me which algorithms they can for time series. So I think that's one thing we need to explore when we're looking at the gap. Um, one thing that I very much liked about this is, by the way, live on Katie Nuggets, that they actually analyzed this by <coughs> who made the response, industry, government, academia, and student. And they took the middle value, and they looked at which algorithms are used more by industry, or by, by students, or, and vice versa. And you can see that regression is much less researched by academics and, stu and students, but much more used in industry as a whole. Pinch of salt, 844 voters, not too extensive, right? You can have a larger sample, but at least it gives us some indication of uh, one of the most widely frequented platforms that it is. So, new networks, by the way, very much, much more applied in government and industry than is being researched. Yeah. 
So that's that's disappointing, but there we are. And of course, deep learning, massively researched, much less engagement in industry and government. So there seems to be some validity with the relative pecking order of things. But it doesn't really tell you exactly which algorithms are being used. So why don't we have a quick stroll through the algorithms that you can use in times of how they've been developed over time. And what better way to look at it by looking at the um, looking at the, the improvement in compute power that we had in the last couple of years. Um, I, I was only able to find something that actually is an exponential growth. That's, that's always very hard to fit on the screen, right? So I just want to give you the gist. And I'm looking at the sweet spot of algorithm development, which ranges from the 1970s to the 2000s. So if this is time, and then you have the number of the processing power increase, and the number of transistors, and of course you know, you all know Moore's law from 1965, who said that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every every year, roughly, and that it will continue to do so. And today, today, um, this has roughly, this has roughly happened. There's also a data law and a disk storage law and other things. And of course, there's a widening gap. Um, so, if you took my previous remarks uh, with care, it doesn't mean just because big data is no longer the hype sign, but it just means it's everywhere. This is a, this is a much, much more prevailing problem than just a single problem. There. Yeah. But looking at the algorithms. The first algorithms that were developed in forecasting really were in the 1950s, 1956, Brown exponential schooling, and then Holt and Holt Winters, so all the workhorses of forecasting in the 1950s to 1960s. 1970s was much more dynamic regression, Arima models, Box and Jenkins. William Jenkins, by the way, co-founded our department, and therefore I've had the pleasure of teaching Arima models to all of my students, and they really, really hate them. <laughs> so I'm not one of the best, um, not one of the most favorite lecturers there, but it's a is basically Jenkins' fault. Uh, <laughs> why did he come up with this action notation? I have no idea. Automatic specification of regression, <laughs> econometric methods, how they, I mean, people are still working on it, obviously, but this is when the first prototypes came out in the 1980s. Um, and then, really, that's when the, when the, the um, computational intelligence, artificial intelligence um, uh, innovation set in. Neural networks were hard made clean, and therefore, in 1986, support vector machines, decision trees, we have to say that, you know, Quinlan and Parallel was developing data and algorithms on you know, uh, decision rules, how you combine them with ID3 trees. Bagging, boosting came a little bit later in the 1990s. Random forest, the uh, 2000s, and okay. Uh, then neural networks again, long short-term memory. Sure, who was gonna tell you a little bit about those today. That's basically deep learning, and <coughs> one of his PhD students started that in 1997. So, a lot of stuff happened in between the, in, until the 2000s. Um, okay, just to make that point, other things happened as well. Okay, nearest neighbors, but Cobalt and Hart was in 1967. So I can't show you everything, right? Uh, but I think it gives you a good picture of the development, uh, where things have happened. So if you look at that, these are very simple algorithms. They are probably more sophisticated, more data hungry, more, more computational power uh, hungry. By the way, just a small note data science, data mining. Data mining, I think, was first coined in 1995, data science in 1997, analytics 2000s. Yeah. So before that, all of these things were called statistics. Yeah. Because I always had people say, like, this is a machine learning algorithm. And somebody else says, no, this is an artificial intelligence algorithm. I said, well, at the time, it was all the computer science. Was. OK, so that's, um, that's the algorithms that we have. So what is the reality that we have out there? Is there a gap? So we did this practitioner survey. Um, and it had all the rigor. We asked thousands of people. It was web-based. Uh, we did pre-test and so forth. And we got 540 responses. Um, of that, 200 could actually be used because people were basically incomprehensible when they were answering at times. Um, lots of consultants in there trying to just get a copy of the survey. Well, we had 200 valid surveys in manufacturing. That's pretty rare because there's not that many surveys of practitioners and how they actually do forecasting. But um, we never had this down really to forecasting in time suit, and we wanted to know how do they forecast, you know, do they use statistics and analytics, and also what kind of algorithms do they use. And um, so that's a robust design. The breakdown of the 200 manufacturers is the majority came from food and beverage. Um, uh, we have other consumer goods, electronics, computing, consumer healthcare, beauty, pharmaceutical goods. But the majority is food and food and beverage. Probably because we have sample selection bias, we just have most of the contacts in our networks that we could approach. And um, so what happened? What approach, the first question we asked, like, what approach do you use? Statistics or gut feeling? Right? Of course, we were simply looking for statistics. So, and then, so we have three options. Why do we have three options? We'll get to that in a second. So, what do you think was the lowest response? What do they use the least? <coughs> no, only judgment. Only gut feeling. People that don't use any statistics at all, that has the lowest response rate, 25%. 
but second, you pay only statistics, roughly more. So very few actually use only statistics or analytics or data science in order to make forecasts. The majority use statistics and make some and around it. Right. So they actually take a forecast that's done by a statistical algorithm, fully automatically, with all the right or wrong properties, and then they adjust it. Right. You only need adjustment if the algorithm wasn't capturing what we wanted to capture in the first place. So, okay. Um, that's quite common, that's prevalent, that's actually best practice if you ask people who do consultancy in the supply chain. They actually say, you know, I mean, you should actually make a statistical focus and then you adjust it. Um, I'm not sure if that, goes, that resonates well with the, with the statistical community. But um, so most of the stuff that we develop, somebody else looks at and says, ah, I think it's going to be a bit more. <laughs> I think he's going to pay back the loan, right? But this thing, that's absolutely absurd. And there's lots of study on the psychology of decision-making humans that shows that this actually leads to very inferior and biased results under those circumstances, but we are generally very much convinced of ourselves, so we just keep doing it, because we think we're pretty good. Okay, so altogether, about 70% of all the industry forecasts are made using some form of judgment, um, which is a lot. So uh, that limits automation, that also limits validity, and other things. But we're more interested in, if they're using statistics, what kind of algorithms are they using? And um, so we looked at the potential forecasts. Of course, you can have multiple in theory, you could have multiple algorithms to make one forecast, but they don't generally use all sort of methods. So, order from top to bottom, I'm going to spare you all the animations because we have to speed up. The top ones is exponential swing. So it's all sorted from the highest average response to the lowest average response. So about 34%, 32% were using exponential smoothing. About 30 were using averages. Very sophisticated statistical algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> by um, Excel. No, uh, so averages. Actually, averages is a, that's a good idea. It's not a bad idea because it smooths out randomness, you know. So actually, an average is the right approach to this in many circumstances. But of course, an average cannot really take care of seasonality or trends or other things. Um, so it's a very limited model class that works well for stationary processes. Actually, if you have a stationary process with noise, you don't really have a forecast. So let's not go there. It's naive. 20% are using the name. That's the worst forecasting algorithm you could ever use, unless you're in the financial markets, I would say. Um, <laughs> no, it's very, I mean, that's the, you know, pharma, French, very hard to outperform. But, okay, econometric models. 9% use econometric models. Right, that is still five years ago. Intermittent, a remodeler, and that's my pet peeve, neural networks. Just, you know, basically nudged up from 0%. Um, so that's not good, right? So 75% altogether use very simple models that often they cannot capture causal variables. They can't even capture external influences, right? So it's a univariate model, and um, neural networks of stuff that is post 1980s is very limited use, and well, very few use explanatory variables. Econometric and neural networks can use explanatory variables, but it's very limited in use. So remember the stuff I showed you on the hype cycle? How cool everything is? What we're doing? And Katie Nuggets, and wow, we're doing all this. That's the reality. That's what, at least in manufacturing, and that's a, that's a substantial piece of our business, certainly in Europe, if you're looking at industrial manufacturing of consumer products. So the use of methods is really developed, uh, it's limited. And all of these things, 75%, were developed and finished their development 1956 to 1960. Should I ask again who's in industry? Should I ask you whether you answered to our survey? Anyway, no, okay. 1960s, just to give you a flavor of how old these things are. Yeah. <laughs> That's the 1960s. So if you're using algorithms from the 1960s, let me ask you, does your vehicle fleet look like this? Because just, oh, by the way, these are all cars from the 1960s, just to show you a slight, slight change that occurs over time. That's an American car. That's a German car. <laughs> That's an English car. <laughs> You know how these cars look these days? Okay, the English don't have any cars anymore. <laughs> yeah, so quite a lot has changed, right? Okay, does your vehicle fleet look like this? Is that how you go to your customers? Uh, your hardware look like this? That's an IBM 704, uh, at, actually at NASA in 1957. Um, I think it was capable of storing at most eight variables in memory at one moment in time. Right? So you were limited basically to a seven period average. That's as cool as an average. Right. Okay. Um, do your employees look like this? <laughs> I don't know. Actually, that like that. So basically, why do you tools like this, right? I mean, if 
Why do you not look so bad? This, this is incredible exponential story. 55 years old, right? It's basically a hammer. I'm not saying it's not a, it's not a pretty hammer, right? It's not, but it's a nostalgic thing that people actually collect these days. But with albums, you're using it every day. That is just to give you a feeling of time because most of you were born before 1956. That's when Kennedy actually became president. That's when the Russians flew into space. The Americans also, but it was a chimpanzee. Yeah, so the change in technology adoption there. And then um, the US invaded to a trot in many peaks there. Right? So that's a long time ago. So let me just ask you, are there new tools available? Well, we looked at the new tools, right? But if you're thinking about a hammer, can't we do anything better than a hammer? And this does the same thing as a hammer, just much better. <laughs> it's a nail gun, and you can drive a 60 nail through a 2x4 uh, board at about 200 yards. If you can sit it off, and you just... You know, this doesn't exist, I just made but, uh, <laughs> this up. But this is a real nail gun. And of course, you know, what do you want to build your house with? With a real hammer? With the old hammer? Or with a nail gun? Right? So there is this thing, horses for horses, but certainly there are new things. We try to estimate how big that gap is, right? So if we look at the survey, the gap that we have, this is probably the maturity of industry adoption of algorithms that we have. Right? Maybe that's slightly unfair, and it's biased towards low-tech industries, right? Consumer package goods. But we'd certainly get generalized for that. That's maturity, that's where we are today. And that's your gap. And that's only 56 years of lag in adoption. <coughs> Still with me? Still remember the hype cycle? Yeah. Three years, we're out? Okay, five years. 56 years gap. But the problem is, I mean, for us, 56 years sounds like a long time. That's a lifetime, right? That's more than a lifetime in human times. But it's less, is it less or more for an algorithm? So it's an interesting question. How long does an algorithm live? How long? Regression has lived forever, right? It's going to live, keep living forever. So I thought, well, how, can we, how can we judge what this is? Oh, by the way, before, any, anybody here that considers themselves a data miner in the room? Yeah? Because normally data miners look at that and say, like, yeah, I knew it, forecasters, you know, they use all this old stuff. Nobody uses that anymore. Yeah. They're really behind. Yeah. I mean, logistic regression was developed in the 1920s, and most industry applications still do some form of logistic regression. Yeah. So, I mean, data miners, yeah, that's even older, possibly. Um, but my, back to my question, is it fair to say 56 years? That's the gap, right? We have to catch up a 56 year gap. Because in, you think about it, Different things have different lifetimes, right? So is an algorithm, does an algorithm mature the same way that a human does? So there is this thing called contradiant cycles, which actually, I don't know if you know that very interesting story. Um, uh, he actually got shot for developing this theory uh, in the 1920s, of course, because he, he postulated that the capitalism could actually survive by going through peaks and troughs of innovation and therefore reinventing and <coughs> increasing productivity again out of a recession. And uh, he postulated that these waves exist roughly around the age of 50 to 60 years. So that would mean in human lifetimes or in innovation cycles for industry would be one contradictory cycle behind. To be um, fair, nobody was ever able to, no, nobody with econometric or statistical skills was ever able to prove the existence of any of these cycles. Right? But if you believe in technical analysis, then you can bet all your money on that if you want. Um, so I wanted, I mean, what, what other cycles are there? What other lifetime spans are there? So if we, somebody once said, you know, IT is basically like dog. So if we measured algorithm maturity in dog years, the dog has about 10 years of lifetime expectancy, and IT is similar to that, and it would be five, five and a half generations. That's 403 dog years. That basically means if you teach a dog a trick, that dog has to basically wait for the carpet for three years. But it would have to wait five and a half, five, six, you know, five point six generations until it actually apply the trick somewhere. Right? Until it can get on the sofa. That's a long time to wait to get on the sofa. Okay, I lost you. Nobody really likes <laughs> what does a good German do if we get confused? We look to the law. They have all the rules. And we look to um, accounting and they say, oh, IT hardware by right? paragraph 253, article 3, you have to depreciate by hardware, mainframe, seven years, workstation, three years. So if I measure this 56 years in IT cycles, then it's 784 years. We're, by IT terms, we're only 700, roughly 800 years behind in IT donation cycles. That's a lot of work for us, isn't it? Okay, how can we do that? What, what's the answer to that? How can we close the gap? 
keep calm, do more research. Right. We just is it is it the lack of research that we have that exponential smoothing is there and and neural networks is not? Is that the, is that the case? So I did a quick lit review. This is the number of papers from neural networks, three well, roughly four thousand. In the same time, three hundred seventy papers on exponential smoothing. So there actually is zero correlation between the use and the adapt adoption in industry and the amount of research we produce. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It just means that, you know, as academics, we can go on unnoticed to mm -hmm. do interesting research on neural networks, fly to Vancouver to a conference, present it, and uh, then fly back and no harm done. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what is the answer to that? Okay, we have to adopt it. So how do we adopt it and what, what could we adopt? If you think about adoption, um, what do we adopt? What level do we do? Should we upgrade to 1970s technology first? Should we do that? Yeah, is that the solution? Do you say, oh, let's have a look at ARIMA models. <laughs> they were really good in the 1970s, and then you're like, okay, so that's the same thing as, you know, introducing, you want to do deep learning, and you get this out IT infrastructure. 1980s, get out the shoulder flaps, and then upgrade to 70s. By the way, 1970s, uh, this is advanced exponential smoothing, gets automatic specification, double, triple, exponential smoothing, various algorithms that have all been developed over the time. I'm not saying these aren't good, you should try them out, but uh, maybe if you want to leapfrog, maybe you want to go to the 1990s state space, or you want to go to the 2000s and do new networks like I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have to go back, I didn't sell that well. But okay, new networks, um, certainly on Vogue at the moment, and just as a quick teaser for straight away later on, they're quite straightforward. One of the, one of the workhorses is actually from the 1980s, so it's not really 2000 technology, but uh, it was actually popularized around 1990, 1991. Okay. Um, and it's a class of statistical methods which basically mimics the way that information processing works in the brain. There's little small neurons and they're all connected. And uh, you can tell a whole fascinating biological story around this, but in essence, all it does is it does an input output mapping. And whatever you give it in the whatever you give it as an input, it tries to map it to the output and learn the relationship. So if you give it past sales data on the input and future sales data on the output, it will try to learn the relationship between past sales data and future sales data. So it does forecast. And because these are all interval scale variables, it's just the regression that it calculates. And if you look closely and you understand what's going on in the processing, I can tell you now that each of these nodes, this is a graphical representation, each of these nodes calculates a simple nonlinear regression on the inputs and a simple nonlinear regression on the inputs Nonlinear regression on the inputs and a nonlinear regression on the inputs, and these are all lag realizations. So these are nonlinear autoregressive models, each of these nodes. And then the second tier calculates a regression on top of a regression. That's the only innovation. So this thing in itself, with a, with a linear activation function, would be linear regression, would be an autoregressive model. But this thing, this tier, is new. So you have a, you have a regression on top of a regression. Maybe if this thing learned the regression that it gives equal weights to 25, 25, 25, and 25 percent, then it calculates an ensemble. Maybe that's an average. Or maybe this one learns a weight of 1, 0, 0, 0, and then it does model selection. So you suddenly have a class of models that can showcase a lot of complex behavior that you didn't have before. All the rest is the same, so basically if you understand regression algorithms, you can learn neural networks in a few hours. If you don't believe all the gibberish about it's like a mini brain and you're building an ant or something. <laughs> so basically a class of nonlinear autoregressive processes, only feed forward, straightforward. If you write down the equations properly, it is regression. Okay, we trust regression. So by the way, why should we trust it? Um, oh by the way, you can do cool stuff with it, you can do boosting, bagging, and other stuff, but I'm gonna have to jump over that because I just wanted to show you at least two or three examples of what we've done with neural networks because um, I'm getting an early warning. Uh, apparently I have to answer questions. Must I? Do you kind of piss off everybody in the room and then I have to answer questions? Okay, this is just one example we did with a very large UK retailer. Um, and I can't mention the name, so I'm not going to do it, um, but it's the largest UK retailer. Um, <laughs> up at the top, you can see the regression model that we built. This is a, um, a manually specified dynamic regression model which has a number of variables and it has past sales, it has up to five advertisements. It has different discount codes, price events, bank holidays, weather information, all of that factor in. And the forecast you get, multiple step ahead forecasts from each point in time, trace forecast, rolling origin, estimated, in sample, is actually the red. And you can see that there are some problems there. 
And the problems arise because weather and price are not linear beasts, right? You can lower the price of the mine. That's a good example. I don't know. You can you can increase the price of chocolate as much as you want. You will still eat chocolate in Switzerland, right? You can lower the price of German chocolate as much as you want. <laughs> so you can see it's a nonlinearity. Right? The same thing goes for temperature. The same thing goes for uh, a variety of things, and that's why linear regression models will have really hard times. You have to really specify carefully with lots of additional variables. A neural network, however, is a nonlinear model and learns directly from the data. So I'm just going here. The, the fit of the red, and you can see the fit of the blue is much better around special events. You can learn all the same things, but it's much better behaved. It's more robust. And actually, the approximation is, is faster when you have the lower level. So that works. Um, you can actually you can even unmask that and you can actually look at the elasticities. Um, and these elasticities are nonlinear. So the blue line is actually the fitted line of the neural network on the actual data, and the green is what the linear regression tries to do. Because it can only do linear stuff unless you do adequate transformations, which require an iterative model methodology, and people like Henry and others have been working on that for 40 odd years, trying to get this automatic transformation specification methodology in place. It's pretty hard. And a neural network does need it, so it just does it. And that's because I don't know so much about regression, I'll just use a neural network, and it works. We've also done this with uh, simpler stuff. So this is a case study with, with Firestorm, Nivea. You've heard that? It's not chocolate, but okay, maybe it gets you excited. Just one example. These are some algorithms in SAP APO, and we added artificial neural networks into SAP APO in order to learn particular types of seasonality that work well. And you get a substantial improvement on it. I'm not going to bore you with this. All of this is properly done and written up in papers, so you can, you can get it from me if you want. Um, and we actually implemented that many years ago. So they've been doing that and using it in multiple countries. Um, also, we train neural networks to support them with model selection, and what you get is substantial improvements in accuracy over the complete of the time. Uh, I'm going to jump over some more applications because I want to make a final point. So, newer, better algorithms do exist, they work in practice, you just have to adopt them. That's the main point. Um, so, that means you have to extend your toolbox to a better toolbox, which includes more algorithms. And um, if you do that, you can include artificial neural networks and try out these things and see how they work. However, a small disclaimer, beware. I made a point for new algorithms and new tools, but old tools work as well, right? If a regression is exactly what you need, just use a regression. If you, have, if you want to build a tree house with your son, build a tree house, don't use a nail gun, just use a hammer. Yeah? Uh, if you're in the US and you want to build the biggest tree house in the world, and this is the biggest tree house in the world, it's actually built around a living tree, you cannot see the tree anymore. I think that's an American way of saying big enough. So that's actually, you can see trees in front of it, but that's, you probably want to use an appropriate tool, right? You want to use the right nail. At the same time, new tools don't work every task. So if you have a detailed mind, you think you want to build a carefully crafted regression model for the single most important item in your assortment, but don't use an automatic algorithm. Do something where you can actually fine tune it yourself with your expertise. So some tools are useless for the task, and being in Switzerland, I have to ask you, like, I mean, what is that? That's just, <laughs> you, know, you know what this is? It's a pocket knife. I mean, how big are your pockets? You must have huge people, massive pockets. So some tools are just useless. <laughs> it's not a pocket knife anymore. It was good when it started out, but then they got it. There's another thing I want to mention. Um, and um, I'm not going to... So there's, there's lots of hype around this, right? Uh, particular, another big best word that I haven't heard is the cloud. You didn't see that just appear from the high side of the video, did you? No. It vanished before big data. But it's productive, it's there. And just to make a point, uh, um, an old hammer in the cloud is still an old hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Exponential smoothing in the cloud. And there's quite a few software vendors that are selling you exactly the same algorithms they implemented in their old software, just now calculating faster is still an old habit, right? So as, it's, as the saying goes in England, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's most probably a duck. Yeah. So that's there. So all tools. And finally, um, because I have to stop, um, finding the most expensive hammer doesn't make you the best carpenter, right? So that means it has to have to do with skills. It's not just a tool you buy. And if, I, if you remember this one, I could actually show you the forecast in the software packages underlying this. And before you step up in front of me, I'll just leave you with this, that 
most expensive packages, which are SAP, APO, actually drive the adoption of the simplest algorithms, while it's the cheapest algorithm, the cheapest software packages drive the adoption of much more advanced algorithms. So it's, it seems to be counterproductive. There's, of course, there's humans involved, there's processes involved, there's consultancies involved, but you can actually look at that by the different packages, and some packages just don't drive improvement. So, with that, ask yourself, can you afford to ignore 60 years of progress? Hopefully not. And if you can't, by the way, we don't think we can, so we actually started to work with a small company where we try to drive this into, into productivity so people can no longer argue that they can't use an APO. And at the same time, you can also go to conferences like this, and I'm organizing a particular expert in London, there's another one in Berlin where you can learn more about how to do these things. Sorry, that's shameless advertising in my life. And I'll leave you with the takeaways. Thank you for your time and your, uh, I look forward to your questions and maybe a bit of